and even feeling grief when Lazarus died, feeling the grief of the family and what what was going on and the grief of this loss. I mean, even knowing, okay, I'm going to restore this in a really incredible way, but he still wept. I find that very impactful. Welcome everyone to Reclamation Podcast, a Be Emboldened initiative. If you are new to us, I am Naomi. I'm the founder and executive director of BE. We exist for those impacted by religious trauma by providing support for the prevention of victimization and re-victimization. We desire to create a safe space to ask questions and to heal. You can learn more about the resources and support services we offer by visiting beembolden.com. I'm excited that we now have sponsors for our podcasts and different things that we do, like our live streams. This episode specifically is sponsored by Yobel. They are an adult clothing and accessory company focused on the ethical treatment of every individual in the fashion industry, stewarding the planet and its resources in a sustainable way and ensuring that profit is mutual, not at the expense of someone else. You can support their ethical and sustainable small business while also supporting Be Emboldened. You just go to shopyobel.com and enter live free in the notes at check out. The owners, Emily Emily and Clay, are just amazing people. They're doing incredible things for their community and beyond. So we hope you join them in the impact that they're making. So grief is what we're talking about today in a specific context, though. It's a grief itself is a core emotion in religious abuse healing. And today we're talking about grief rituals specifically. Joining us for this conversation is Ryan Ramsey, who you may know from Instagram. If not, go follow him because he puts out these short sayings. I mean, it's just Ryan. I mean, how can you not? How do people not share what they see you share? I don't I don't know how they wouldn't. Um, It's short. It's to the point. It's impactful. It packs a punch. And like you're going to you're going to read what he says. You're going to feel it. Um, And it's incredibly powerful for healing. So check him out if you haven't. He is a chaplain, soul care provider, writer focusing in the area of religious abuse recovery, as well as grief support. Prior to this current work he's doing, he was a pastor for over a decade, primarily overseeing pastoral care and counseling ministries. In addition to chaplaincy training and theological education, Ryan is completing certifications in grief counseling and integrative somatic trauma therapy. So, Ryan, thank you so much for being here. I know this has been a long time coming. We have scheduled and rescheduled. (laughs) Yes, we have. So I'm excited for this though. So to give everyone a little bit of background, Ryan and I, I mean, did we find it? Was it on social media? Is that how we got connected? Yeah. I want to say initially we connected on social media and then we were recently able to connect in person, which was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So before my family relocated out of Colorado, we were able to, I was able to sit down with Ryan at a coffee shop, you know, in, in the state that we were both in. And just really realize we've got some significant overlap in some areas that I think are really cool because they're areas that I usually say are super underplayed when we talk about religious abuse and healing. And that's grief. Usually people aren't really honing in on that. And the losses that we experience through religious abuse are huge and can be all encompassing, touching everything. So I really appreciate, Ryan, how you bring that into this work. It's so needed. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to jump into our first question here um, to kind of get us started on the grief ritual aspect specifically, because again, everyone, that's what we're going to talk about today is this idea of grief rituals. And you might be thinking, okay, what even is that? But I want to start with ritual in general and give us a foundation for why ritual is a good thing, why it's helpful um, to us as humans and how we're designed. So The practice of ritual is prevalent throughout both the Old and New Testaments, and we can go way back to start learning about this. And yet it seems to be largely forgotten in our topics of conversation and teaching in our culture today. So I want to start off by talking about the benefits of ritual in general. And Ryan, what are your initial thoughts here? It's a great question. If if you don't mind, I'm actually going to open us with a little quote here um, by way of kind of prompting. Um, Listen to this quote by author and grief therapist Francis Weller. He says this, for us to enter the healing ground, we need to become educated in the ways of ritual. 
It is a language that we have forgotten, but one that we are designed to understand and speak. We need to recover our ritual literacy. Mm-hmm. So um, full disclosure, the, the whole area of grief ritual is pretty new to myself. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert. I am someone who is passionate as a learner in this area. Um, but um, Francis Weller would be one of my primary influences in this, again, as an author and expert in uh, grief in the arena of ritual. He's studied it globally and studies a lot of indigenous cultures and how indigenous cultures have practiced grief ritual for, you know, obviously hundreds and thousands of years. So um, why do we need ritual? What is important about ritual? I think um, folks like Weller would say that the practice of ritual or particularly grief ritual is as ancient as human culture itself. And in some ways uh, I think he would say ritual precedes human language. Um, It is its own language. And the, the, the problem we, you know, modern Westerners uh, immediately encounter, right. Is most of us are not ritual literate. So to even hear the term, we sort of, you know, glaze over or, we have this sort of, I did deer in the headlights uh, response, but um, at its most basic level, and we can get into more, you know, specific ways to define ritual, but ritual is um, a beautiful and ancient and primal way of releasing grief. Um, And in the context of, you know, indigenous cultures, this was one of the primary ways um, people healed from grief or loss was to practice, participate, engage in ritual. And, and again, in, in an indigenous setting that always meant communal group, Mm -hmm. community village. So um, there are ways that we can practice ritual individually or even in solitude. Um, And there are components that we can kind of get into to talk about that, but at its most basic level, um, it's a way, uh, a beautiful and ancient way of, of releasing uh, grief that I think we as modern Westerners have so much opportunity to learn um, and begin to maybe restore and practice again. Um, but it, it, it's unique in that um, it provides a means of healing that we may not be accustomed to um, beyond just, say, you know, psychotherapy. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity here, even as we talk about religious trauma, abuse in faith contexts, I think the arena of ritual provides a lot of healing potential for us. <clears throat> Absolutely. And when I, when I think of the word ritual, I think of ritualistic and that this was initial, you know, before I really started thinking about, okay, what is this word and how am I actually practicing ritual already? Mm-hmm. And I realize I, I do. I mean, I think pretty much all of humanity does in one way or another, maybe not yep. in a grief context, but in general. And so, but when I think of ritualistic, I think of bad things. Sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 You might think of, you know, uh, Wiccan practice or some sort of, you know, satanic cult mm-hmm. gathering or, you know, there are some very negative connotations, but um no, I think, I think, and, and sort of gets back to what Francis Weller's point, um, ritual is as, is elemental to human culture. And um, it's, it's, it's the, uh, it's one of the primary ways that most cultures throughout history have um, learned to um, gather together to honor uh, grief. We might, um, to, to make this more concrete, maybe, the most obvious example probably we would we would identify in our culture here in the US would be our memorial services or funerals when a loved one passes away that in itself is an a, a form of ritual you might say a limited form of ritual but it absolutely is you know it's one of the very few uh, contexts where our culture allows at least a brief moment for us to gather and grieve a loss right but that that funeral service itself is a ritual um, so, um, I think one of the, one of the many challenges is to, is to reclaim, I think the value of ritual and perhaps that includes, um, you know, dispelling or, um, 
helping helping some of us sort of uh, take away the negative or scary uh, associations we might have with it, like you mentioned. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. And when you were just talking about the memorial services, I think we saw, I can speak for the United States at least, but we really saw the impact through the pandemic of not being able to gather when people were losing loved ones. And I've seen the ripple effects of that and the pain of people who weren't able to say goodbye because of hospital restrictions, people who weren't able to gather um, when someone had passed on and the additional pain that people are still carrying around because they didn't have that ritual to to be able to feel what they feel. And like you've mentioned, do it in a community setting with others who are similarly feeling those feelings. So, and to go beyond, go beyond kind of ritual in this grief area, like we're going to focus on today, it, although it kind of, it kind of touches on it. One of the examples I thought when I was thinking through this myself was, when I was a hospice social worker, I had a ritual at the end of the day. And this is encouraged for people who are in, you know, support professional roles. How do you step away from that step into your family? And a ritual is recommended. And I would, you know, you take off the badge, you shut down the computer, you don't even leave it on you. I mean, for me, I, I prayed over my caseload, you know, I, I was like, Lord, you know, they're in your hands anyway, but like, please, I'm, I'm stepping out right now. And so please, you know, be with them. Um, let your peace be present. And I, I had to do that because, you know, I'm, I'm not always seeing people who have had full lives and it's their time, you know, that's not always the case. And this is again, a loss of life, grief specific, and we see other forms of grief, of course, and religious abuse. But that's that idea of how do I how do I even step away from this this grief for a time if I if I do need to take a break? And so I'm excited to get into these more. Yeah. I want to touch on I want to touch on grief, also kind of bigger picture. Like we just touched on ritual bigger picture because again, like I said when I opened, and I know you've agreed with me in past conversations, grief is underplay here. Uh, grief is underplay. Period. <laughs> everywhere, at least here yep. in the United States. That's so, right. yeah. And so this is another experience that isn't necessarily getting the attention that it should be getting. So, and yet it's a significant aspect of life. So what is your view kind of big picture on grief and grieving? Yeah. Um, well, it's, it is, I think for us in the advocacy, you know, helper profession, it's very sobering to talk about grief and to, to attempt to persuade people that we are serving and caring for because we live in such a grief phobic and grief denying society. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this is a very serious uphill challenge for us, you know, as counselors, as providers, as soul care workers and advocates. But um, I, I would say, I, I think one of the beautiful opportunities we have as, as counselors, soul care providers, et cetera, is to um, help invite those in our spheres to welcome grief as a means of um, um, healing, but but to, to relate to grief as uh, a welcome guest in our lives, and to learn how to integrate grief integrate grief into our stories and into our lives, because we're probably innately trained to deny or to sequester, you know, grief or to repress or to numb. Um, those are things a lot of, a lot of us are very good at myself included, uh, naturally. But I think the invitation for us is to slowly begin to reframe and re-understand grief as this valuable, um, experience, but also inevitable experience that, uh, we live with, you know, uh, part of that might mean, I think we need to, name that grief is not something that pops up occasionally when, you know, say a loved one dies, mm -hmm. we lose a pet, you know, a tragic loss. Those are obviously examples, but actually grief is more like, I would say oxygen that we breathe almost every day. We're grieving things. We are um, absorbing and processing losses, myriad losses, visible and invisible all the time. And those don't have to be death losses. They can be all kinds of losses, right? Loss of health, loss of job. Um, you know, we can get into the sort of manifold ways that grief shows up, whether we like it or not, it, it shows up, it knocks on our door. And I think the question is, 
how are we um how will we greet the guest of grief when when it shows up and it it does it shows up all the time we just may or may not have language or vocabulary to name it um and we may or may not have tools to do that work of integrating it um into our lives so that we can heal Mm -hmm. um I'll, I'll pause there and let you respond, but we can, we can certainly elaborate. Sure. Yeah. Some other ways that grief I think shows up just day to day. I mean, sometimes it's a disappointment and mm-hmm. you know, maybe there's this a distinction between, Oh, disappointment, but there can be a sense of grief that comes with a, a strong disappointment mm-hmm. as well. And so, yeah, being able to feel that allow ourselves to feel that. I really appreciate what you're saying about, welcoming it into just the fabric of our lives, you know, of our day to day, because when, when, of course I'm sitting down with someone and maybe this isn't, of course, maybe, you know, this is something to think about a little bit more, but typically someone is coming to be emboldened because they've collected quite a bit over the years. And so they're coming and they've got quite a bit going on so much that they're grieving they haven't really stepped into yet. They haven't really opened it up to say, okay, I'm going to start feeling this. And so then when they say, okay, I'm willing, because there's a willingness to saying, okay, I'm willing to feel this. I'm going to allow myself to feel this. There's this fear that can come with it of this is going to drown me and it may never end. And so Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm afraid to step into it. And so that's one of the conversations that I have with people is, how this is, this isn't just something to check off the list either. Now, granted, they realize it would be a big thing to check off the list, but it's like, it's not something we just check off. It's, it's, it's alive, (laughs) you know, it's it's this living process that will continue to go through. And sometimes it'll, it's going to kind of ebb and flow. And I've experienced so much in my own life with losses. There are seasons where I, I would think I would be really grieving and I'd be feeling that very strongly. And I surp- I'm surprisingly, I'm not. And mm-hmm. then the opposite can be true. And sometimes it's just, I'm focused somewhere else or whatever that may be, or there's a certain reminder, or maybe I'm in a more vulnerable raw place to begin with. And so I feel it in a different way, you know, that fall versus the previous fall. Um, and right. so there's just so much that goes into it. And so, yeah, again, I really appreciate what you're saying about just, this is a part of our human experience as we mm-hmm. grieve. And again, we see that throughout history. We see that throughout scripture to pull that into it. We see ritual throughout scripture. We see these patterns of living. We see these rhythms to people's day, to their seasons. And, you know, there's something about just how we're designed. I think that we've lost focus of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you just mentioned even the um, reference to scripture. One of my favorite descriptions of Jesus is Jesus as the man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief, right? Mm -hmm. Um, He uh, was not just familiar with grief as a concept, you know, theoretically. He was, um, you know, a man who was acquainted deeply with grief. He experienced it himself. He embodied it. But um, I think that verse is another place that reminds me like he he learned to um, integrate the reality of grief into his own um, life and experience. It wasn't something that he sequestered away. Um, so anyway, that's that's a beautiful um, description, I think, of of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting. Just I've never thought about this before. And of course, this would be you know, as, as hypothesizing, we don't know, but we read so often in scripture how Jesus, you know, stepped away and he had that quiet time. And I guess in my mind, I've always thought he was having, this is going to be telling, right, of our culture and the impact of it. I'm curious to hear what you think. He's like gone away quiet. Okay. He's resting, but he's kind of like planning, thinking about what's coming or what's next. Or he also may have been feeling the weight as we see in the garden later of the mess and the pain and the suffering and the losses. And he had the grief of what's what he's witnessing um, in, in the creation. So I just yeah, again, kind of absolutely. maybe I don't want to put words there, but that's a possibility. And again, my head being like this productive driven person, it's like, Oh yeah, he's thinking about what's what he's going to do tomorrow. And like, Oh, probably mm. not actually. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And of course, you know, we we're familiar with the, the, the garden 
passage, right? Um, one of the most intense uh, moments where we see Jesus, I think, in anguish, but I would also say, um, you know, very, very consciously and emotively grieving um, mm-hmm. and pray- praying to the Father. But right. yeah. Right. And even feeling grief when Lazarus died, mm-hmm. even knowing he was going to come back to life. I find that very impactful. Mm-hmm. Just feeling the grief of the family and what, what was going on and the grief of this loss. I mean, even knowing, okay, I'm going to restore this in a really incredible way, but he still wept. Right. That's, that seems to be very telling, doesn't it? That, mm-hmm. I mean, Cause Jesus could have said, don't worry about this anymore, guys. Like, right. have you heard about the resurrection? <laughs> you know? um, let's move yeah. on. Let's move past these sad feelings. <clears throat> Yeah, that's powerful. Mm -hmm. So taking these two different concepts and putting them together. So ritual and grief. I want to start. What do we mean then by a grief ritual? What are we talking Mm -hmm. about for someone who's never heard this term before? Yeah, um, I'm going to I feel like Francis Weller is like our third invisible podcast guest today. But um, I have to reference him because he's my primary source here and he's really an expert. But um, can I can I offer a description he gives and then we can kind of play on that? He says there's something about ritual that resonates deep in the bone. It is a language older than words, relying not so much on speech as on gestures, rhythms, movements and emotion in this sense. Ritual addresses something far more primal than language. Mm-hmm. So um, <clears throat> I think using that description, we can start to get uh, a feel for sort of the basics of, of how to define a grief ritual. I would say in our context, um, a grief ritual can be a very simple uh, practice, repeated practice um, that we do. It can be done in solitude. Um, I know, you know, um, this is something you and I probably do from time to time where um, you feel the need to sit alone for a few minutes, maybe to light a candle, um, to sit in quiet, uh, perhaps to pray or to, to read something. That's a most, that's one of the most basic uh, forms of ritual we can practice on our own. But um, uh, another example would be, you know, um, the idea of, I think in an, in an, indigenous or historical uh, description would be like a talking circle. Um, one of uh, the most beautiful and basic ways we can practice ritual is, is for a group of people to gather together in a circle and hold one another's stories. Now in our, in our day, you might think, Oh, so like a counseling support group, you know, or um, a grief group. Yeah. That, that, that could be the case, but um being intentional to gather for the purpose of holding one another's stories in safety, offering that container uh, for grief to be witnessed. Uh, that's a beautiful and simple way uh, that a, a small community or even group of friends mm-hmm. could practice ritual. Um, if I can offer one more example, maybe to provide some imagination, we had a dear friend, this was probably two years ago now, she faced a really tragic and painful uh, divorce Mm -hmm. and felt the need in her soul to hold a ritual for the end of her marriage. So Mm -hmm. she invited some dear friends, some ladies to meet. They met sort of in this really beautiful mountainous area here outside of Denver and held a a grief ritual uh, for the end of her marriage. And there were several components and elements to that ritual, but it was really to bear witness to the loss of her marriage Mm -hmm. and to allow some space for release um, and witness so that she could continue to move forward. Um, So those are a couple examples, but, but um, yeah, what are your thoughts there and, and, and how can I uh, add some more perhaps detail or, or description description? I really, I love those examples that you gave, particularly about your friend. Um, being someone who's gone through a divorce as an example, my gosh, it's something that like most things that we may grieve or people, relationships, ideas, dreams, whatever it looks like, whether it's tangible or intangible, we can feel like we are to grieve that privately, I think, mm-hmm. in our culture. And I, re- I see that so much when I reflect back on my own story. 
Like, yes. okay, I'm going to, I'm going to step out and I'm going to deal with this privately. And then I'm going to step back in when I kind of have it together again. Right. And I know I didn't come by, I didn't come across, you know, I didn't come to that on my own. And I see that again in, in the stories of pretty much everyone that I, I talk with. And maybe there's that one close person, but the idea of kind of going broader and I know in, um, in Francis's book that you're referring to, I know he talks, you know, co yes, community, the whole community, or um, I believe he also will hold grief rituals where they're in initially strangers, right? Who come together and then ultimately feel grief as he a does. collective whole. And so imagining, gosh, you know, that can happen. An environment can be safe and secure enough where people can really feel that grief together mm -hmm. and allow whatever that looks like, whether it's, yes, I'm, I'm wailing, I'm, I'm moving around. I'm just, I'm on the, whatever it looks like to really feel that and let our body really feel it. I mean, there are times mm -hmm. where in my head, I have seen myself drop to the ground and cry out, but I haven't done it. Mm -hmm. There's that restraint yep. of this would not be proper. Now I'm not saying if I was, you know, in the grocery store, that would maybe be the best, best idea. Because right. I may not get the support I need in that moment. It may not serve well, but knowing, okay, but was time ever created then? Was a space ever created to be able to let that out in a way that it needs to, to be shown? And how mm -hmm. does that serve others who are watching? What permission does that give? And so, again, it's just, it can be culture changing. So I'm also going to press pause and let, let you take it from here. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. I think the idea of ritual is inviting us back into embodied and communal experiences to honor and release grief. And, um, you know, um, I think the, the spoken or unspoken assumption also is that when we create space for ritual, we invite the sacred. And so, you know, again, if you're talking about an indigenous tribe or culture, that was always embedded into the idea of ritual it was sort of making space or holding space for the sacred. Um, and, and, you know, if we're, um, if we're speaking as um, followers of Jesus or Christians, I think that, that, that holds the same uh, for us too, that when we create space um, communally and um, create embodied practices together, we're inviting the presence of God um, to be with us in those spaces um, and ultimately to be, to be the presence that uh, heals all of us. Right. Um, and so I think ritual is a unique way, um, to invite, um, uh, God's healing presence into our lives and into our stories. Um, and, and ritual, again, it moves us out of, um, you know, we're a heady cerebral culture. We're also a fairly, um, you know, um, tight lip, closed lipped, um, non emotive culture. And, and it, it invites us back into get, get into the, the, somatic reality of our emotions and um, a healthy uh, expression and release of, of emotions. And, you know, I'm, I'm more and more sobered by the day because so much of this is just, it's just not familiar to us, is it? It's just mm -hmm. not very familiar to us. And yet I think um, it's a frontier for us uh, in, in the advocacy community in the religious abuse survivor community Um that I think there's immense opportunity for us to begin to practice this. And that doesn't mean you have to become a world expert in grief rituals. Um, you know, Weller says like every ritual should be indigenous to you and the community that you reside in. And so there's not like a playbook that we can read and say how to practice rituals, you know, professionally or whatever. It's more like um, it's more um, artistic uh, experience that we can, um, we can engage uh, mm -hmm. together. And you mentioned earlier, it's, it's almost, um, we are accustomed to uh, privatized pain, privatized grief and suffering. And I think that is, I think one of the areas um, we're going to need to have to address because private suffering or private grief is ultimately not adequate. Um, if, if we're only willing to, to grieve or hold our losses on our own in private, then inevitably what's going to happen is, um, that grief is going to get lodged or frozen in us because 
it needs to be witnessed. It needs to be witnessed by people in a, in a, in a safe container context. It needs to be witnessed communally. That's how we're wired as human beings. That's how we're wired as relational creatures. And so um, the private pain aspect of our, our, the world we live in is, is a real challenge. It's interesting to think about different, yeah, different displays of grief. I'm thinking of, I'm reminded of a time where I was in the back corner of a church and I was on the floor. I couldn't, I was just, I, yeah, just where I was at at the time and being in a church and feeling like I couldn't leave the church and I needed to get out of the church. But ultimately there was one very kind woman who came over and just like, was there kind of knelt next to me. And I think there can be this, this perception when we're, we're left alone or depending on how people even approach us in that, like there's something wrong, there's something wrong with us because we're grieving and because we're feeling that pain and there is something wrong. I mean, it's, things are not as it should be. So we can be aware of that. You know, this mm-hmm. world is not as it's supposed to. We're not supposed to be suffering in all of these ways forever. You know, and as Christians, we believe that won't be forever. And so yes. but there's nothing wrong with me in this life, in this body, experiencing these things. This is a part of life. This is a part mm-hmm. of being human. And really what everyone in that church probably could have done was join me. Mm. Yes. Whatever Absolutely. it was for them. And that absolutely moment. that's the invitation that's always the invitation mm-hmm. to join one another um to bear witness to one another i mean you think of you know again the new testament metaphors of church or um even even the commands that when one member suffers we all suffer with them mm-hmm. you know this mm-hmm. is not a new this is not ultimately a new idea is it's not a novel idea but it feels that way sometimes mm-hmm yeah, it does. It's a whole paradigm shift. I mean, there's this mm-hmm. whole perspective change that has to happen about, I would say less about ritual in my mind, more so about grief, but yeah, mm-hmm. this then tying it together of, okay, what does it look like to put it together? And I, you gave the example of the memorials. You also brought up, you know, that you and I likely, you know, would light a candle and that's exactly something I do at the end of the day when mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, my day is done. Um, and I need to, I need to, feel what I felt throughout the day that maybe I didn't have time to feel always in the moment. And I would, I would offer that that's okay. You're not always able to, in that exact moment, for example, if I was really feeling something, strong, I might not show that in fullness in front of my five-year-old because he wouldn't have an understanding. He would just be concerned. I wouldn't be able to explain that to him. Well, it doesn't mean I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to show something, but I may not fully allow myself to feel it in display. Mm-hmm. So I may set that aside and come back to it later. And so there's something about, yes, in the evening for me, lighting a candle, um, playing a record, whatever that looks like. And I recall so many times in my healing journey so far where I, I knew God was present, but it's like, I can't, I can't read your word right now. I don't know what to say to you right now, other than, will you please just hold me? Mm-hmm. And that was it. It's like, will you just hold me right now and just be here because I, I've got nothing else. And I just, I, I can't even think about what else to do for myself or what else or what to do tomorrow or how I'm going to come out of what I'm feeling right now. I'm just feeling it right now. And the really incredible thing, Ryan, is that when we do that, some space frees up. Yep. So I didn't have to worry about what was next. I just suddenly was like, okay. I can breathe deeper now. I don't feel so constricted. And I, I see that, yeah, there's, there's some hope moving Mm -hmm. forward. And it just, that just naturally happened. It was the Mm -hmm. result of allowing myself to feel what I felt. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah. And I think you just described, you know, um, another expert in the area of grief, she describes, um, grief as uh grief is always at play and at work in us we get to either we choose either to grieve consciously or if we don't grieve consciously we grieve subconsciously and subconsciously grieving um does a lot of damage it it compounds our pain um it comes it means that pain that pain is going to come out sideways it's going to come out in more you know potentially distressing destructive and hurtful uh, means so the invitation to all of us 
is to do what, what you've done. And sometimes it's just paying attention to you. I think I want to, I want to light a candle. I just want to hold some space for a few minutes. Your decision was to consciously uh, honor um, the, the emotions that you were, were holding, even if, even if you couldn't, you know, um, succinctly um, describe what all you were holding or what all you were feeling. Um, but you held space for it. So you, you brought that grief into the conscious realm and that's the invitation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for those who are listening, I use this term a lot too, the idea of like holding space and people want to be like, what exactly does that mean? And so I'm going to give it kind of my definition. I'm happy for you to chime in too. Yeah. It's really allowing the time to, to think about, feel, be present with, be like, okay, this is what's happened or this is what's going on. I'm going to be here with that right now. And I'm going to allow whatever that looks like. That's the idea of holding, holding the space for it. It's recognizing it, being aware, recognizing it, allowing it. And there's something about paying it that attention of saying, okay, this is worth paying attention to. There's a, there's a dignifying of it that also happens. I think that's also where we say like yes. the string of it being sacred can come in of like, you know, this is, this is significant in my life. And yes, you know, I can invite God into that as well. And so there's, there's all this that kind of goes together. And the idea of doing that for someone else, we talk about, you know, witnessing for someone else or holding space for someone else. We're sitting there in that with them. We're not trying to fix it. We're like, yeah, I'm going to be here and, and feel it. However it is, I feel what, what you're showing and what you're expressing, or I'm going to be silent with you. You know, but this is about having another body next to you who is going to join you in whatever it is that you need to express right now. So, yeah, I'm curious Absolutely. what you want to add to that, but. No, I think that's, that's well said. That's beautifully said. Um, yeah. I think the the most basic um, principle of, of ritual is intention. It's, mm -hmm. it's just offering intention to your time and, um, so that intention may be what you just described, um, giving yourself, setting aside a few minutes to light a candle, to be present, mm -hmm. um, be, being present to the moment, um, honoring whatever comes up, you know, uh, inside you and, and then listening. Sometimes it also means attuning to, um, the presence of God. And, you know, that's a whole, that's probably another uh, conversation, but, mm -hmm. um, I find that, that God is often, um, eager to honor, uh, our intention to, to hold, to hold those kinds of spaces. Mm -hmm. Um, and he, and he's, he's eager to meet us there. Yeah. And this isn't a judgy thing. Mm -mm. Yeah. I'm not sitting there and thinking, gosh, I feel this way, but I shouldn't. It's like, I feel this way, you know, and there's some emotions I have. There's times where I'm angry, where I feel envious of something or I feel some resentment or, you know, different kind of feelings I can have where I'm like, I don't really want to feel this way in this situation, but first I would have to acknowledge that I do. And in mm -hmm. grief, we might not want to feel grief. It doesn't, it doesn't, I, I mean, I would argue there is, but you know, I'm, I'm pretty far into my, my grief theology at this point. And so what I mm -hmm. say, more, like she's nuts, but I, I don't, mind. I don't have an aversion to feeling grief. I see a real beauty in grief in the grieving process and the grieving experience. Um, and so I, I do see it as a part of my day-to-day -day life and I do create mm -hmm. this space for it. And I see beauty in paying attention to it and the things that created it and acknowledging those emotions. And, um, and again, I'm, I'm then able to move forward. And I wouldn't say with this lightness that it's gone, but with this lightness that it has been recognized. Mm -hmm. If I That's can draw right. a distinction between those two. That's right. Yep. And, and um, to, to per perhaps add a little bit of nuance, when we're the more that we're willing to integrate and honor grief as a, as a reality we all face, um, the more that we'll see that the, the way that grief gets expressed might look different every time. It doesn't always mm -hmm. mean if I honor my grief, then I'm going to collapse into, you know, despair and wailing and my whole day is going to be you know, uh, ruined. It, sometimes, right. sometimes grief could be expressed as a smile, 
mm-hmm. as a, a bittersweet longing. Um, you know, it, it could be expressed in all kinds of ways uh, emotively that don't necessarily look like, you know, crying endless tears. Um, if, if we're, if we're prone to associate it that way. So, um, the invitation is to see and frame grief as normative to the human experience, inevitable to the human experience, but also like grief carries vitality. Grief reminds us that we are alive actually. And I think, um, the more that we get to know grief, the more that we see we need, uh, to attend to grief as a welcome guest. And if we don't, that's when, that's when the, um, um, that's actually when we stop living, when, when we do don't welcome the guest of grief. Absolutely. I think we have two options. We can welcome grief as a guest or grief is going to be a robber. It's mm-hmm. going to be a thief because mm-hmm. we will not, we will not fully feel the other feelings Mm-hmm. If we're trying to shut a specific emotion out right. and grief will not just go away, it's going to stay there. And so eventually, like you said, it's going to come out sideways mm-hmm. and we might not even know what is happening and why initially. So, and I thank you for bringing up that it doesn't always look like weeping because yeah, when I light a candle in the evening and I, you know, I, there's something about the lighting. It's not, you don't have to light a candle. You guys It's just, I like the soft lighting. It's just you know, <laughs> right. less sensory input enables me to be more focused. So, but I'm usually not crying. It's usually not that it's more of just kind of sitting there and just, yeah. Okay. Like this happened and I, mm-hmm. I feel sad about it. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to let myself feel sad for a little while, you know, and then, and then I, stand up and I move on. And um, one encouragement I have for people who are new to grief, and this is, I think, a form of a ritual, is to choose a designated spot and time, you know, kind of create this situation where, okay, I'm going to go there every day, whatever days of the week I'm going to go there, and this is where I'm going to allow myself to reflect. And I'm going to allow myself to feel whatever comes because of that reflection. And it may take some time, might not feel anything for a while. You might go completely numb. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if someone just did um, dissociate it in some form. So yeah. or to some degree, but in time w- we start to learn like, okay, this is where I can be in this place. And mm-hmm. so our, we can kind of train our bodies in that rhythm of, okay, here's, here's when and where I can, and it's safe to do so. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. My wife and I hosted our first, you know, this is the thing, right? We have to just, we have to get out there and try, right? This is, this Mm -hmm. takes like, it's an, it's an invitation to creativity and artistry. Ultimately, Um, these are Mm -hmm. organic processes to practice ritual. And so we hosted a group back in the fall as the leaves were turning here in Colorado. And we invited a group of people. These were all religious abuse um, survivors. Mm -hmm. And we went on a hike together as a group. Um, we included some space for silence and reflection during that, that hike process. We also asked every member of the group to, if they wanted to bring an object that might symbolize either a loss or a longing Mm -hmm. that they were holding. And so, uh, several folks in the group brought a particular object. And at the end of the day, we went back to this cabin where we stayed. And several folks um, brought either a document, perhaps, that that sort of re- reminded them mm-hmm. of uh, condemning words or betrayal that they experienced from, you know, a faith community. And several folks wanted to burn um, mm-hmm. the object. And so we witnessed, you know, um, a, a, a really condemning abusive letter be burned. Um, mm-hmm. We witnessed one other woman in the group throw a very old Bible she had into a river um, because that Bible represented uh, an abusive faith leader. Mm-hmm. And so um, just some pictures and illustrations of um, how we can imagine ritual and, and, and community. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And just, you know, for anyone who's listening, who would think, Oh my goodness, you took God's word and threw it in a river. I I had to get rid of my dad's Bible. mm -hmm. I mean, he was a cult leader. It was all marked up. It was all written in all kinds of lies and deceit and scribbles and pictures. And and it was like, I just can't, like, I had to get rid of it. I'm like Mm -hmm. this, this, no one should have their hands on this, honestly. Like not yeah. this one. You can go get a different one. So, 
Yep. I so one other comment I wanted to make before we we conclude um, head into our last question here is allowing myself to feel grief has actually increased my rootedness. It mm. hasn't decreased it. And I hope that encourages people who maybe feel like they're stepping, they're, they're stepping into this whole grief, grief world of, okay, I'm going to allow myself to start feeling this, or I am feeling it and I don't know what to do with it. And okay, how do I incorporate ritual? How could this serve? How would this help me? And may feel like they're actually losing control of themselves. Like they're losing the ability to regulate or to look forward or to go through their day. And allowing myself to feel grief has increased my rootedness in who I am, who I've been designed to be, who I am in the different roles I have within my life, and who I am as a daughter of God in my relationship with him. It has actually further cemented all of that. And so it is some, it's a it's an experience I am incredibly grateful for. So just again, I want to offer that for everyone to consider. So yeah, well said. as we think about religious abuse in this context specifically do you have any suggestions for someone who's just kind of getting started as far as grief ritual maybe they've been feeling grief for a long time you know maybe they have it maybe that's new but as far as grief ritual where's maybe some some practical suggestion of how they could think about incorporating this in yeah um <clears throat> well you know it, it may be like you and i i think my instinct um was to to begin by learning and so mm -hmm. one practical option is is to read um and 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 become a little bit more educated about mm -hmm. both both uh grief as a topic itself but then um, grief ritual and i think you'll find that a lot of books out there include both um grief and ritual are, are very often enjoined um in in the literature and so um you might begin by just becoming a little bit more familiar with sort of d almost developing a vocabulary for grief and for ritual um and that that really helped i felt like that gave me both permission to enter into this journey um as someone who's experienced betrayal myself and abuse in faith contexts um and it also i think has provided me a lot of imagination. Um, so, you know, read, read the articles, read the books. I'm, I'm you and, you know, you and I are happy to share um, resources that, that we've benefited from, but beyond that, you know, I think the encouragement would be to think simple, you know, we don't have to, we don't have to create elaborate um, uh, rituals at the very beginning. We can think very simple and, some of the things we've already mentioned would be opportunities. Um, what feels um, it's, it's going to, it's always going to be organic. It's going to be organic to you, to your story, to your longings, to your desires. But um, maybe you can already identify um, for listeners. You can already identify rituals that you've already been practicing and you, you maybe just didn't, you didn't name it as such. Um, but also just paying attention to, um, how you might simply offer and hold some space for a loss or a longing, um, whether that's holding a candle or whether that's getting out into nature, um, whether that's inviting a friend to experience um, or honor part of your story together, just relationally, um, whether it's inviting a smaller group, you know, I, I, I um, the opportunity is for um, y your grief to be witnessed and um, that, that grief can be witnessed in solitude in the presence of God, but it can also be witnessed in the presence of others. And so um, I think there's an invitation here for artistry, isn't there to, to find sort of the inner creative um, in all of us and pay attention to what, what you might want to do to express or to honor um, painting, you know, my wife, um, her first instinct often in ritual is to paint or to express in drawing, you know, um, something that she wants to, to honor or release. So there's a, there's another idea. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And it's uh, initially you may feel like, well, gosh, I don't know. I don't know what to do. 
but but give it a minute and you're going to have this most likely I'll say anyway you're going to have this sort of it might feel impulsive and it might seem kind of like, oh, this feels a little crazy. I don't know. <laughs> might feel very out of the box. But yeah, creative. What do I need to do? I remember I was working with an art therapist at one point after my mom had passed away. And she's like, okay, what do you need to do? I'm like, I just want to smear paint all over the wall. And the next day, I the next week I came in and she had covered one of the walls in brown paper. It was wow. one of the best therapeutic experiences I've ever had in my life because mm -hmm. I got to do the seemingly crazy thing that I just felt inside of me to do. It was like, I just need to make, I need to make a mess because mm -hmm. I feel like a mess. I mm -hmm. feel the mess of it all. None of this should have been how it was. And I feel the mess of that because again, if someone's new to my story, my mom's death was tied up in religious abuse. It's tied mm -hmm. up in cult theology. And so it wasn't, it was a very unusual, complicated grief situation. It's very yeah. complex. I'm like, this is a disaster. And I just, I need to create that externally. I need to see it. I need to be able to touch it and feel it and be a part of it in a different way. And it enabled me to do that. It was incredibly healing. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, think outside the box be like, gosh, what is the impulse I have? If it doesn't hurt me and it doesn't hurt anyone else, how can I make that happen? So, right. so right. Ryan, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for, for having this conversation. I know we're both still learning. We're kind of leaning into this. We're both Absolutely. really interested in it. We, we see so much value and we're kind of, you know, feeling out how do we apply this? What does this look like in the smaller ways and the bigger ways? So for those of you who want to follow along with us and learn along with us, Ryan, where can they find you? Yeah, so um, you can definitely find me on social media. I'm pretty engaged in both uh, over on Instagram and Twitter. My handles on both are at R Ramsey Writes. Um, I also write, share some essays and occasionally some poetry on Substack. Um, you can find me on Substack as well. And those would be some good places to start. Wonderful. Again, thanks so much for being here. Absolutely. Great to be with you. Thank you.